great to be here today. A lot of things to talk about. And uh, one of the things I want to get you to think about is different ways of thinking. When I was a little kid, I had all the full-blown symptoms of autism, no speech, no you know, social interaction, I would just do repetitive behavior. Now, the autism spectrum is a very big spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you have half of Silicon Valley, you got all the half the people who work at NASA. You got Steve Jobs, I'll mention him because he's deceased, so I can mention him. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have somebody that remains nonverbal. I want to emphasize the geek and nerd and mild autism, they are the same thing. Because if you didn't have any autism genetics at all, we wouldn't have this webinar equipment to broadcast over. <laughs> See, the thing is, you can make a brain be more cognitive or make a brain be more social. And there's a wide range. When does geeky and nerdiness become Asperger's? There's no black and white dividing line. But the problem is, the normal human mind gets totally hung up in the language. And they don't see the same kid. I'm a visual thinker. So I see the same kid. The words don't mean that much to me. What means to me is what I say. Now, I am a visual thinker. And to understand animals, autism, art, and mathematics, you need to get away from verbal language. And one of my big concerns today is I think the verbal languages people are kind of taking the world over. They're definitely taking the schools over. And I don't think that's a good thing. Because you need us visual thinkers. You need us mathematician minds. And I'm going to explain why, we, why we're needed. Animals' world is sensory based. And animals' memories are pictures, sounds, taste, and touch sensations. You want to get away from language. Now, in normal human beings, there's a certain type of Alzheimer's. That as the language parts of the brain get destroyed, art comes out, maybe math comes out. You see, these other kinds of thinking are buried underneath language. When Van Gogh painted Starry Night, I don't think he realized he was painting mathematical patterns in Starry Night. I don't think Van Gogh even knew anything about mathematics, but he was doing it in this painting. Mortal people ignore details. So it was an interesting study where people were put in a brain scan machine, a functional MRI machine, to look at um, uh, what parts of the brain turn on when you read out of a book. And when you put the autism person in the scanner, just the details. The autistic mind's in the details. But we need people that are interested in details. I think one of the big problems we have today with a lot of policy stuff is we're not paying enough attention to details. How's this policy going to affect different things on the ground? The Asperger gets both the details and the syntax. But guess what happens when you put the normal person in there? You lose all the detail. So on my very first work with livestock involved uh, finding the things that cattle were afraid of. And the cattle did not want to go into this veterinary facility because the flags they're waving. Sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. They wanted to rip up the facility rather than remove the flag. It's like they didn't see it there waving. Look at how that animal is looking right at that streak of light. You know, that's the sort of thing that animals notice. Sensory detail. I'd get down in the chutes and see what they're seeing. On a sunny day, you've got all those, those stripes there. Cloudy day, you're not going to have that. You know, they're afraid of a lot of little things that we tend to not notice, like a chain hanging down. I train the veterinary students and the animal science students. I want you to look at what are the ears doing? You see how that horse and the zebra have an ear on each other? Then the other ear is on me. I want you looking at detail. You see, my kind of mind is bottom-up thinking. I take a lot of little details, and I put them together to form holes. It's bottom-up thinking. In many policy things and in many jobs, we need a bit more bottom-up thinking. Are animals afraid of going to the slaughter plant? I found they were more afraid of the chain hanging down. They're more afraid of the fact that maybe the tunnel's too dark. And at this particular plant, they put white translucent panels in there uh, so the cattle could go in there and they'd not be afraid of the dark. Yeah, people automatically assume they're afraid of getting slaughtered. No, actually, they're afraid of things like the dark and stuff like that. And another thing that oftentimes they're afraid of is looking at people up ahead. And when I show this slide to my students, over half the students do not point out the three people standing where they shouldn't be. The animals probably don't want to approach them. Sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. This is the ruins of a Japanese nuclear power plant. You know, three or four reactors mill it down. And when I found out why this happened, I just couldn't believe it. 
You know, nuclear reactors in emergencies have to have emergency generators to run emergency pumps. It's not very wise when you live next to the sea to put your very important emergency generating equipment in the basement. Because when the basement fills up with water, the generators aren't going to work. Neither does the electric pump or any of the electric wiring work. That's what they did. This is a design mistake I would never make. Because if I had toured that plant, I would have seen water coming over the seawall and going down there into the basement. Another design mistake I'd never make was airbags killing kids. Now that's a situation where an engineer blindly followed the spec that the airbag had to hold in an adult man with no seatbelt. Well, the dude better do up his seatbelt because when it's that powerful, it's going to kill the babies. See, this is where we need the visual thinker working with the more mathematics thinker and the verbal thinker. I do a lot of work with the meat industry. Guess who lays out the whole entire great big meat packing plant? You might have a big cut floor with a hundred conveyors in it. It's the craftsman, the visual thinker. That's who lays it out. I'm a total visual thinker. It helped me in my work with animals. I realized my thinking was different when I asked people about church students. I'm very interested in different kinds of thinking. And people that tend to get labels tend to have more uneven skills. They might have a label of learning disabled, dyslexic, maybe just kind of different, uh, ADHD, you know, various things. And they'll be really good at one thing and bad at something else. And I get very interested in the different kinds of minds. And most people, when I ask them about a church people, they get this vague, generalized thing. I only see specific ones. There is no generalized one. Well, now, looking at some of the brain research, when you get the generalized one, you're getting it out of the association cortex. I go all the way back deep into the visual cortex. So my concept of what a steeple is, is bottom up a whole lot of specific examples. Well, I think on many policy issues, we need to be doing more of that bottom-up thinking. Because you're getting people very verbal, they get a degree in something like uh, government administration. You mean somebody can get a degree in bureaucracy? I think that's pretty terrible. And, <laughs> and uh, they go get a job in Washington, and they've never been out doing real stuff. I'm really into real stuff. You know, when I was a child in the 60s, boy, we did stuff. Built the interstate highway system, went to the moon. It was a bipartisan doing, getting actual real things done. And these steeples flash up into my mind like a series of pictures. Here's childhood ones. How about local ones here in Fort Collins? Or famous ones. <coughs> I can put them in different categories. You know, with their individual pictures, I can categorize them. I used to think everybody thought this way. And then I found... That, you know, I find the different ways of thinking really, really important. Because they've got to work together. Let's go back to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was the artist. But he has to work with an engineer to make the insides of the iPad work. And there was a little disagreement between Steve Jobs and the engineer on the iPhone 4. And they disobeyed some rules of antenna design. And the antenna did not uh, work very well. Because pretty trumped antenna design. When I asked an astrophysicist the question, he saw no images. He just saw the motion of people praying. Motion. And he saw this motion in a very, very abstract way. You know, this was a mind blower for me. Because I found many people that saw a generalized steeple. Now, why did I ask steeple? Because if I ask you something that you own, like your own dog or your house or your car, most people see that. But I ask you something you don't own that you're not quite so familiar with, then the most of normal minds go into the generalized church steeple. Now, being a visual thinker really helped me in my livestock work because I could test run equipment in my mind. I thought everybody could test run equipment in their mind. I didn't know a special skill. I found most of the so-called normal crowd designers for uh, you know, equipment, they can see a still image, but not the, uh, not the movie image. And in the movie, an HBO movie, they duplicated all my projects. I really liked that. And how did I sell myself? You know, when you're a weird geek, one of the things I had to do was show off my portfolio. I'd tell people, we got to bypass the regular HR. Because our regular HR people, they're going to be all turned off by the weird geeks. <laughs> what you got to do is get the portfolio of mathematical formulas, programming, writing, uh, uh, graphic design, various things they've done to the correct people, like the graphic design department, 
to the um, math department, the programming department. We need to get these things shown to the right people that will appreciate that work. I learned I had to sell my work rather than myself. You know, and we're getting worried about too many really smart people getting screened out of things. There are some of my drawings. When I showed up my drawings, boy, people took me seriously when I whipped one of these out. <laughs> so I tell a lot of people that are kind of different, make sure you've got this stuff on your phone because you never know who you might show it to that can open up the back door for you. There's another picture. Now I noticed kind of a bad thing. When the meat industry went from doing drawings by hand to doing drawings on the computer. I started finding odd perceptual mistakes on drawings because they weren't seeing the drawings right. Okay, here's one of my curved cattle handling facilities. And you might wonder why I make it curved. Well, cattle like to go back to where they come from. Well, one thing you gotta learn is you gotta learn how the drawing relates to the picture. You've got to learn that. You know, when I first started out, I walked around this great big swift plant, the drawing, so I could compare how a square on the drawing was a column that maybe held up the roof. These are some of the mistakes that I got when we started getting the industry over into the computer age. Cer center of the circle, not in the middle of the circle. Uh, 25 foot long gates. They didn't uh, swing their gates to see if they actually work. And every time I got one of these really weird drawings, and I got them from every single major company, it was like some 22-year-old kid never built anything by hand, never drawn by hand. You see, you've got to touch in order to perceive. So I had an interesting trip out to Pixar. Been to Pixar, been to Disney Imagineering, been to a whole bunch of places like this. And you know what? They have found, too, you have to touch. In fact, when they first start a new cartoon idea, they draw it first or they can print it out on the 3D printer. And where do people keep their little 3D printer, little statues they get out of the 3D printer? Where they can touch them. They're all clustered around the computer because you've got to touch. Because if you don't touch, you don't perceive right. We've got to work in the educational system on building up the strengths in kids. I'm worried now with all the no child left behind and all these strict standards, a lot of creative people getting screened out. And the creative people that we need in industry, they're the ones that think up the new ideas. I used to joke around that I had a huge internet trunk line deep into my visual cortex. Turns out that I do. These scans were mind blowing. Now then up here, I got a real, real, real big one right up there. You know, gigantic <laughs> thing just for visual thinking. And at the University of Pittsburgh, they got a fabulous new scanner that the Defense Department funded for looking at wounded warriors. Well, I was one of the first autistic people to go on it. Oh, these scans are like rubbish compared to what this scanner can do. And it found all kinds of interesting things, like a tiny thread-like auditory circuit. That's why I don't learn very well through my ears. A language output circuit that had problems. You know, a lot of speech therapy helped overcome that. Now let's get into another kind of mind. This is the mind of the pattern thinker. This is your mathematician, your computer programmer, your engineering mind. That, this is the, you know, it's a different kind of mind. Thinks more in patterns. I just want to show you, this praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of paper. No folding, no scotch tape. And what you see in the background is the folding pattern. That's not my mind. This isn't how I think. And this scientific research now that shows there's two types of visual thinking. There is my kind, it's a photorealistic picture, and then there's the more pattern, rotating objects in space and they're different kinds of skills, and they complement each other. Let's go back to our nuclear reactor. The pattern thinker designs a reactor, but maybe you need me to design the safety systems, because I would see the water. How could you put generators in the basement? I'm now seeing, you know, big diesel generators the size of semi-trucks, and they're underwater, and then the plant's baby blue. I actually went by the plant about 10 years ago, and it's baby blue. There's some guy on a baby blue catwalk, and he is now saying that Japanese is a lot of bad words because he knows we're in so much trouble, it's not funny. Okay, here's a real important slide. Let's look at the different kinds of minds, what they're good at, what they're bad at. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker, so what would I be good at? Industrial design, drafting, all kinds of graphic design, 3D animation, architecture. Those are all things I would be good at. I could not pass algebra. 
I would not be able to graduate from college today because algebra is required in many colleges. So how did I get through college? Well, in 66 and 67, the required math course was finite math, statistics, probability, and matrices. I'm not saying get out of math. Why not let the kid take geometry? Let the kid take trick. I'm finding tons and tons of kids that can do geometry and trick, and they can't do algebra. I know a kid that hasn't graduated from high school, and he's doing college physics. You know, maybe if you're a chemistry major or an engineering major, you're going to have to have the algebra. But maybe if you're a computer science or a physics major, or how about industrial design, or, or a theater major, or something like that, or an English major, let's substitute some other kind of math. I'm worried about screening out tons of people. I'm not saying totally water things down. And I had to have a lot of tutoring to get through the finite math. But we need the different kinds of minds. Because let's look at the other really bad nuclear power plant accident. Why did it happen? They turned off their safety system to test it. OK, to me as a visual thinker, the two worst nuclear power plant accidents we've had in the world happened for reasons to me that are like so stupid I can't believe they did it. Now, I used to think it was stupid. Now I'm realizing it, they're not seeing it. Now, one of the pattern, pattern thinkers are also really good at music. Then you got the verbal thinkers. You see, the verbal thinker is much better at sequential things. I'm much better at associational thinking. And when I took the journey to the center of my mind on this fabulous new scanner, oh, this thing is like so fabulous, I found out I've got parietal bushes here that come out the corpus callosum. Most people have them up in the frontal cortex. I've got them here. Well, that's going back in the association cortex. So that tends to make me want to go across disciplines. We need different kinds of people working together to really solve problems. Then you've got other people that are auditory learners. They learn everything through their ears. And they have problems with reading. Just to show you that there's different ways to do algebra. There's the verbal way, and there is the geometric way of doing it. And you can sometimes have a kid where, where uh, they can do the homework, do the algebra, Okay, we're going to have to get that phone off. Where they can do the um, uh, uh, do their work without doing all the calculations. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they can do it that way. You've got to rule out cheating, so you need to lock them up in a room with no electronics and just uh, just paper and sit and have them do it. Rule out cheating, then they should be allowed to do it. I think it's difficult for people to realize that different kinds of people think differently, and you have the people that are labeled normal. Yeah, it's a lot less variation. They're kind of more evenly good at things. But you take the people that are maybe have a label, they might be really good at something. But also, they pay for it for being really bad at some other things. Now, how do you form a concept with all this specific information? I have to sort it and put it in file folders. This is a picture of a little kid showing me that he's showing how he's sorting cats and dogs into different um, file folders. It's bottom up thinking. Now, to be a good bottom-up thinker, you've got to get out in the field and you've got to see lots of different things. You know, you've got to fill up the database with a lot of stuff. I thought my mind got really good when I got to be about 40. I had enough web pages loaded into my mind that these little parietal fibers can find because it's a really, 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 really good search engine. <laughs> Dogs form categories. On the leash I protect, off the leash I, I go play. You see, that's a category. It's a visual category. Horses will do the same thing. You can have a horse on riding. The rider is treated as a separate thing from on the ground. So you can have a horse that might be fine to ride, but he's bad about being handled on the ground. You see, that's different file folders. Sensory based. All right, let's look at associational thinking. Okay, most people, if they think about a vacuum cleaner, they tend to think about their own. But I saw this big, huge, scary, awful vacuum cleaner that we had in my elementary school. Horrible big thing. It was about this big around, had a giant bag. I was sure it was going to eat me alive. <laughs> and so, why did I think about school play when I thought about this vacuum cleaner? Because it was stored in the closet in the room where we had school plays. You see, there's an associative link there. You see, that it, there's a logic to that. that kind of, that's exactly how search engines work. When search engines were invented, I'm going, wow, this is made just like my own mind. But who do you think builds search engines? Well, they got some autism genetics. I'll tell you, the techies, they tend to avoid the labels like the plague. They get worried about holding the kids back. OK, I find a lot of people, when they're trying to solve problems, have a hard time categorizing the cause of a problem. This is something that's easy for me. 
because uh, I do a lot of stuff with the meat packing industry, so I've got a problem with a meat plant. I start going through the database in my mind and comparing it to the hundred other plants I've been in. Do I have something wrong with the equipment or is it a people training issue? And I find that most managers have a very difficult time separating that out. That's easy for me because they, they want to go in there and just rip everything up. I go, wait a minute. You know, they're not even, they're putting too many cattle in the crowd and they're not even operating it correctly. Now, if, do I have a major design fault or do I have some little thing that's really, really easy to fix? People don't differentiate on that either. They don't differentiate between a stuck trolley or we've really got a big problem. Okay, and back to the vacuum cleaner. All right, let's look at another case. Oh, BP was into safety rules. Oh boy, you go visit one of their oil rigs, you better have a lid on your coffee cup because you might spill coffee in the break room and you might fall on your hind knee. We can't let that happen. You better hold the handrail. We gotta make sure you don't fall down the stairs. That's safety cosmetics. They didn't look at what's really important. How about process safety? They shorted on a whole bunch of stuff. I don't want to go into all the details, but I read a lot of stuff about this. And they were rushing and pushing and cutting corners. Yeah, the big stuff. That's what we need to be caring about. How do we fix the big important things? Animals and people with autism think bottom up, not top down. And in bottom up thinking, and I think on a lot of things we need to be, you know, uh, doing a lot more with bottom up thinking. All right, let's get back to how we can deal with some of the people that are different in the workplace. One of the things is, don't be subtle. They need to know exactly what they're supposed to do. If they're supposed to do some programming, then that programming has to have a specific output. You know, I, 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 I was in a meeting recently and they were talking about some uh, requirements for professors on their job description and things like this. Okay, now what do you want this professor to actually do? You know, if his job description says 70% research, but he's doing 70% extension. Okay, he's being told conflicting things by different people. That doesn't work. He needs to have a one boss that tells him exactly what to do. And the thing is, there are some people that know how to work with the people that are kind of different and some that don't. But the way you work with them is outcomes. Don't tell him where to do his work or where, you know, let's say he wants to do it from home or whatever. What he's got to do is make certain outcomes. Like saying, I want the perfect speech recognition program where you yak really, really super fast and you don't have to train. Okay, that's super hard. Okay, when I went on this fabulous brain scanner, I don't know, they jammed uh, something amazing into a computer box about this big. They did have to do some hardware changes on the scanner, but the real magic's inside the computer box. That's not my mind. I don't have any idea how it works. But it can do brain dissections on live person. That's like really super cool. Who puts that much computing in this itty bitty box? There used to be an old ad you say there's eight great tomatoes in this itty bitty can. Well, who could put that much computing in this itty bitty box? It's somebody I'm probably on the autism spectrum. I don't know who programmed the computer. I don't know. You know, but it's, uh, and, and, and some of the people in Pittsburgh were saying any technology is sufficiently advanced, indistinguishable from magic. That's what Arthur C. Clark said. Well, I mean, what this thing can do, I mean, it's just it's magic to me. I can understand how the other kind of scanners work. Bottom-up thinking. You form a concept by categorizing specific examples. And there's certain kinds of work where bottom-up thinking really works. And you know where it really works? Troubleshooting. You want somebody that can like, you want to send them out to all your factories and figure out ways to make things better. The bottom-up thinker can do that. The top-down thinker, especially if you're stuck in Washington, tends to overgeneralize. Bottom-up thinking makes it so much easier to put information into different categories. You know, you just, because it's specific, you just sort them. It's like a spreadsheet. The world needs different kinds of minds to work together. And when different kinds of minds work together, they can really complement each other. Okay, let's talk about another example. A lot of my books have a co-writer. <coughs> the reason for that is I have problems with linear sequence. That's what I need the co-writer for. If you want to look at some of my own writings to prove I really can write, you can go on the PubMed database and you can look up journal articles where I'm the sole author. That's my writing. I'm a good technical writer. But I have some problems with sequence and I have to make really tight outlines. So I need a person with a very different thought process. It's been interesting working with the co-writers. But I've talked to them about how they think. And they don't think the same way I do. But one of the things I can't do is like 
throw too much information at them all at once. I've got to like stretch it out more linear. You know, and I've worked with several different co-writers and they have different styles. It's been interesting sort of figuring out how their minds work. Mentors. We need to be mentoring people. We need to be looking at uh, in the high schools. You know, these kids that are different. Um, there's a lot of retired people now that could mentor some of these kids because we're losing some of the best minds. I talked to a retired uh, NASA space scientist. He told me that half of the people that uh, uh, that he worked with probably were on the autism spectrum. He had an autistic grandson. You know, go back and look at the old pictures from the 60s of mission control. Just take a look at that. Very, very interesting. I'm very concerned that our educational system is failing to stimulate the visual and the pattern thinker. They just don't get these other kinds of thinking. And I'm worried about, you know, when they say we've got to have rigor in school. Yes, I'm not suggesting getting out of math, but why not let a kid that can't do algebra go right to trigger geometry? You know, do another type of math. And I have found that certain types of physics and computer science don't seem to need algebra. Chemistry does. I have been involved with quite a few arguments in places, but I wouldn't have graduated from college if I'd had to take algebra. Finite math saved me, absolutely saved me. I never got to do geometry. Couldn't get through algebra. Algebra is nothing visual. It doesn't make any sense to me. I think visual spatial thinking is getting overlooked by educators, and I think this is getting worse. And we're getting a government. Oh, man. We used to do things before. We got people that get degrees in things like government administration that are like a mid-layer of bureaucracy between the political appointees and the people that actually do the work. We need, and they're making policy on stuff where they don't have any idea what's going on out on the ground. That's just terrible. It's a shame. There's so many schools have taken out the hands-on classes. If I hadn't had sewing and woodworking and things like that, I would have gone nowhere. Also, these classes teach practical problem-solving skills. We need these kind of people. I went out to the multinational corporation. All I can say is it's somewhere in the world, because I've got to keep confidentiality of clients, <laughs> that this is somewhere in the world. And it's a fabulous fish research place for fish farming. They had, a, they had a room maybe about three times bigger than this room here, classroom with a higher ceiling, and they had the most fabulous equipment they had developed for this fish farm, all this experimental fish farm. And I looked at the equipment and I go, you know, I could go to Home Depot or, you know, this regular store and buy that stuff, go to the farm store, buy the stuff, and I go, I don't think the scientists here made that. You know who made it? It was the maintenance man. Well, that's a situation where he got in the back door. Maybe that maintenance man needs to be getting a little more credit for that because they wouldn't be able to have the fish farm without the maintenance man. But where are some of these smart kind of kids like that going now? They get discouraged in school. Well, they end up on drugs, they end up in prison or something like that because we're not using their abilities. And then they get frustrated. And <clears throat> this is the stuff that saved me. Oh, if I hadn't had horses, I was teased in school. You know, these, black, these activities were refuges away from teasing. All right, now let's look at some things we're going to have to accommodate in the workplace. People that are a bit different, I don't want to forget about the labels. Let's get into visual thinking and things like this when we're looking at, you know, what look their work. Okay, sensory processing disorder. This is where a person might have problems with screening out background noise. Like a cell phone went off in this room here and I kind of broke my train of thought because brains that are different. See, one of the things that happens is I got extra circuits back here. So those parietal bushes, they're supposed to grow here, not here. So I got all these extra circuits in the back, which for certain detailed thinking is really good, but it does slow down the processing speed <coughs> of the brain. So there's a tension shifting to slowness. People that have developmental differences in the brain, whether it be dyslexia, ADHD, learning problems. I was very interested to find out that they had jet blue at ADHD. There's an article in Fortune magazine about famous CEOs that were dyslexic. And then I just found out the mayor, uh, our mayor is, uh, in Denver, is uh, uh, he's, he's dyslexic. You know, what's going to happen to him today? I wonder, what would happen to Albert Einstein today? What would happen to little Albert today? No speech until age three? Kind of weird. Where would he end up going? Get on so many drugs that he'd be, uh, you know, sonked out. 
but you can get problems with screening out background noise. So some employees are just not going to handle an open cube with everybody walking by it going to the coffee machine or into the restroom. That's not going to work. Another big problem in the workplace is fluorescent lights. One of the single worst problems for people with sensory processing problems, and they can be some of your best technical employees, is fluorescent lights. Some people can see the flicker of fluorescent lights. So the cube's either got to be over by the window, or they're going to be unscrewing some of the fluorescent lights and then maybe get a lamp, just a regular lamp to put next to their desk. Those are some of the things that they can try. The other thing is, uh, some people do so much better with written instructions. A lot of people that are really smart, they can't multitask. There's a lot of entry-level jobs like answering phones and trying to type at the same time. That's just not going to work. Cashier in a busy restaurant, people get talking too fast at them the way I do. They're going to have problems with that. They're going to do better with written instructions. And they're going to do better with outcome instructions. OK, you put me on a project. They work better with well-defined projects. And there's some people on the spectrum that are verbal that are very good at sales. Well, they know exactly what they're supposed to do. In fact, I know a guy that, um, he's on the autism spectrum, and he's a great salesman for Xerox, and he learns social skills from a Xerox sales manual. See, the problem is, when you get all these circuits back here, there's some social circuits that don't get hooked up. So some people are kind of socially awkward. What boss needs to do is just explain well, you know, you, you, they, they think, other people think you're aloof because you didn't say hi. Uh, and there's a scene in the HBO movie where my boss comes in and slams down the deodorant and says, you stink, use it. I think it's okay to be eccentric, but it's not okay to be a filthy, dirty, rotten slob. And the boss was pretty blunt about that. At the time, I wasn't happy about it. And I think that boss might have been a little bit on the spectrum. You know, he kind of knew how to work with me. But we need to be working with these people. Because we're losing the piano people that we needed to have to fly to the moon. This country's gotten away from doing real stuff. Okay, sound sensitivity. The little kid putting his hands over his ears. You know, well, they could wear a noise-canceling headset at work. I went into a company that does a lot of programming. Oh, boy, geek heaven. No, they all had their noise-canceling headsets on. Tension-shifting slowness. We already talked about that. Okay, another problem that some people have, and these people tend to be an auditory, they'll want to, is they'll see the print jiggle on the page. Because there's a problem back here in the brain, you see. In the back of your brain right here, you have shape, color, and motion, and texture circuits. They've got to work together to form images. Something's wrong with that, and the print will jiggle. You can also get that with a head injury. I talked to get a hockey puck to the occipital cortex, give you the same problem. And there's some simple things that you can do to fix this. Let's try changing the colored background on the computer and changing the fonts. Maybe try printing the work on tan, light blue, gray, different pastel papers to reduce contrast. TV type monitors are awful. In fact, these monitors right here are probably bad because of the fluorescent light hidden in there. The only monitors that absolutely don't flicker are laptops and tablets. Laptops and tablets don't flicker. I had a dyslexic student, she would have flunked out of school if she hadn't had a laptop. And I had her back when laptops cost a fortune. And I got one with a research project. And it saved her. You know, it was uh, you know, a laptop. And the other thing that sometimes helps is colored glasses. You know, you see a lot of movie stars, you know, and they're wearing these pink glasses. That's not fashion. They're wearing those pink glasses because it stops the print from jiggling. Some people it's pink, some people it's light lavender, some people it's light blue. You can actually get a thing called Erlen colored glasses. I'm going to estimate that 5% of the population has this problem. I find one every semester in my class. These people absolutely cannot do um, uh, drawing. They do not draw. And, it's, and this can vary from being the, the TV monitor just makes you tired to the principal of jiggly. I've talked to a lot of students that have this problem. Okay, what, can, what are the screening questions? How can you tell if somebody has this problem? Ask them if they ever see the jig, print jiggle on the page. Ask them if fluorescent lights flicker like a disco. Ask them if they hate driving at night. And uh, also, they oftentimes hate escalators because they can't tell how to get on and off of them. And I find it varies from where it just moves a little bit and it's tiring. I find I've talked to students that have had that, they're doing fine at school. Then I've talked to another student where it jiggles a lot, they're about ready to flunk out of school. Mm. 
And I had one student come to me, and, I, and she'd gone out sunglass shopping because her drawings were awful in my class. And she came back with pink glasses and she said, Dr. Brandon, I got an A on my economics quiz because now the PowerPoint slides are no longer jiggling. I'm seeing many talented, quirky, gifted students kind of going nowhere because there's no mentors to challenge them into careers. If you're interested in um, some of these sensory issues, um, I do have a book called The Way I See It, which is um, uh, you know, mainly for teachers, but it does have a, a lot of chapters in there that describe these sensory issues. But I'm worried about the kids kind of different, having more problems today. And the thing is, we need people like diesel mechanics. We need people like uh, certified welders. We need people who can run computer-operated machine tools. You know, I'm saying so there are some kids where technical school and two-year degrees where they need to go. Now, fortunately, most of these aren't requiring algebra. I do a lot of engineering stuff. How do I learn hydraulics? I've got these fabulous books called the Womack books. I don't even know if they publish them anymore. But it explained all how hydraulics worked without a lot of math. And I don't call it how, how a lot of people don't know how hydraulics work. Like use hydraulic equipment in the factory, they don't know the difference between pressure and flow control. Flow control is how much fluid goes into a cylinder, and pressure is the pressure. Some people think you can reduce the pressure with a flow control. You go, no, 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 no. It's not how it works. Okay. This is something I think business people need to be thinking about. Before the economy crashed, Wall Street was taking our best Harvard and MIT graduates. So they can invent garbage, like credit default swaps, computer programs that kind of just skim off money, where it's virtual money. We need to be putting things back into real things in this country. They, you know, what I'm going to call hard assets. And who's going to understand a banking law that's 800 pages long? Boy, they're going to be fighting over that. I think it's disgusting that we're spending more money fighting and lawsuiting over patents than we are on creating patents. This is totally disgusting. You've got people that are patent trolls that buy patents that they have no, no intention of manufacturing, and then when somebody wants to innovate, they sue them, or like hold them up for ransom. Now, I think we need to start thinking about a lot of things in a more visual way. I read this article in a Boston University uh, School of Law paper, and the tech industry is losing about $80 billion a year to patent trolls. It's sort of like a leech sucking the life out of things. Now, how, I think we need to use a visual way to really understand $80 billion. We throw these terms around. Well, I, this is the way you do it. $80 billion equals 16 Denver airports. When the original bailout came out, it was equal to two Denver airports for every state. $5 billion. Okay, how do I understand $5 billion? I've got a new unit of measure. It's called DIA. <laughs> Denver International Airport Units. And That's I think great. if we start thinking about some of this stuff, it's going to help us solve problems. What I want to tell employers out there is there's a lot of quirky different kinds of kids, and oftentimes they get a label, people discriminate against them. You know, let's look at things where you might have to accommodate. Um, sensory issues. Some people much prefer written instructions. They cannot remember long strings of information. They, they're they're going to have a difficult time with office politics. They need to be protected from that. They need a boss that you know, gives them an assignment, you know, that design a certain thing or they're to write a certain thing. Uh, you know, there are people that are verbal on the spectrum. They're very good reporters. Well, they know they go out and they know how to report the news really accurately. But they need to have like well-defined endpoints for their work. You don't just say, oh, let's develop some more new software. That's too vague. You need to say to the programmer, we want to do a virtual dissection of the light matter of the brain, and you've got to fit it in this box. Okay, that's an exam that's been done. We can thank DARPA for that. And that's an endpoint. It's very clear what it's supposed to do. Okay, here's a formal and fixed brain, and you see the little light matter tracks in there. We've got to see those on the scanner. And we've got to know where, where they cross over each other, and we've got to know where they actually intersect and grow together. So we can crack the circuits. Talk about hard. They did it. Now, who crams that much uh, computing in a little bitty box? I, don't, I haven't met the person that did it, but I'm going to bet you probably someone on the spectrum. You know, we need the different kinds of 
minds. And, and, you know, you need to be hiring. And I think, let's look at this. This is disgusting. This is brand new. George Buckley, CEO of 3M Corporation. He's moving R&D offshore, research and development offshore. He says, given the more abundant interest in science in the U.S., this is strategically important. We've got to get these kids turned on. One of the things the industry needs to do is, is outreach. Now, 3M's actually doing this. It really upset me it was 3M that was doing this because they have science teachers and things that go into the schools. Other industries need to do it. Apple's sitting on boatloads of cash. They need to start doing something like that. I want to commend Bill Gates for all the things that he's been doing. You know, we've got to, like, find the quirky, nerdy kids because they're the ones that can really make the difference. We've got to get them to work. So now it's time we better take that Wall Street bull by the horns like right now. And uh, maybe we may have grabbed him somewhere else, too. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm and, uh, open for questions. Hope I made people think. How much time do we have for questions? About uh, 15 minutes. Okay, good. Good. Those are some of my books on autism there and animals. Okay. Uh, if, if, let's see if somebody has a question just right in here. Right here in the auditorium here. I'm going to pick somebody. Okay, right there. <clears throat> Um, I understand, you know, what you're talking about in the sense that there's just so many diverse thinkers and learners out That's there. That's right. So how do we as educators, um, if we don't have resources or we're not sure where a student is at, how do we help them get to a place where perhaps they need to, to go or, or Well, we let's them? look at, all right, you're asking me how do I help a student, maybe it's not heard of, maybe, but we ought to use the mic here for the questions. Um, the question was how do we help the students that are different? I just gave a talk last night about 400 people that were over 50 right here in Fort Collins. And one of them asked, where are the mentors? I said, they're sitting here in this room. We've got every profession probably uh, here, biologists, chemists, journalists, uh, you know, some doctors. The thing to do is we've got to reach out to the schools and, and work with the kids. Now the thing is, how do you find out where a kid's abilities are? Well, it's real easy. What is his best subject in school? Sure was. I did, I did fine with elementary school math. For hydraulic designing, most elementary school math area of a circle, that's about all you need to have for that. And, and I, I was very good at art. And my ability at art was really encouraged. So what's the best subject in school? What does a kid like to do besides playing video games? I'm seeing too many smart kids getting addicted to video games. And they're not learning to program. You know, they're not turning it into an employable skill. You know, they want to, hopefully we'll get them into some other kinds of hobbies. We want to take the thing that he's good at and build up on it. Another thing that some of these kids have got to learn is work skills. I'm seeing too many kids in middle school, they don't do paper routes anymore. Paper routes are one of the best training there is. But you know what we can do here in Fort Collins? Dog walking. Okay, you got to walk dogs, and you got to walk them every day whether you want to or not. That's a great job for middle schoolers. How about fixing computers for local businesses? making PowerPoints for people, make greeting cards and so on. That's going to help on some of the social skills. You know, I'm seeing too many of these smart, quirky kids, they're graduating from college and they don't have one work skill. I've seen some pretty bad things. There was one guy, he got, he got a degree from a major design school. Then he went out and got a job and he didn't like to do the kind of graphics they wanted because he thought they were stupid. Well, it is called work. You see, and this is something where we need to be working on teaching some of those work skills. And when I was in high school, I was, I was to take care of nine horses. When I was 13, I did a little sewing job. I wasn't doing much studying. But I was really good at taking care of nine horses. Every day I had to clean their stalls and I had to feed them. I was doing carpentry projects that other people wanted. I, was pay, I painted a sign for a beauty shop. I certainly didn't decorate it with horses. That would not have been appreciated. <laughs> you guys, you see, when you asked me a question, it was very abstract. You ask me a very abstract question, we've got to get a lot more specific. People ask me these vague questions like, what do we do about these behavior problems this kid has? Well, I don't know, you're dealing with a three-year-old having a tantrum in the middle of the Denver airport? Oh yeah, I saw a great one at Denver airport security. He's on the floor, he's like, he's grabbing an x-ray machine. Three-year-old. Um, or if you've got a teenager with some other kind of problem. No, you've, you know, you're going to deal with that three-year-old's tantrum a whole lot differently than maybe with a teenager that uh, 
can teach it on Sunday. You know, they're going to be dealt with. You see, I can't even start to answer the question until uh, I ask more specific questions. You see, as a visual thinker, it's hard. To me, it's like so obvious how to find out what's good. I ask, what's his best subject in school? What does he like to do besides playing video games? Uh, what's he good at? If he's good at drawing, then I want to have him learning uh, more different drawing. You see, what I do with the cow is actually industrial design. Because on some of the things I've designed, I have to get, I've had, like, for concrete uh, reinforcement, I've had to get drawings stamped by a professional engineer for the concrete reinforcement. But then once I've got that, I can just use it again over and over again. Okay? Are there any tests that you feel do a specifically or a particularly good job of identifying different learning um, abilities or that we can administer to our organization to help our managers understand where their employees learn best or how they learn best? Well, there's tests and they get complicated to do them. People want to do them with labels. I think we've got to be looking more at, you see, human beings are very social. And some of the people that are very good at things like engineering and art and some of these specialized jobs, they're not that social. And we need to have managers that are more interested in getting good work out of the guy. And the other thing with these guys, don't abuse them. Don't work them to death into the ground. When they get abused, they hack. And when they get abused, they hack computers and do stuff like that. You treat them right, then they don't do that sort of stuff. But they need a boss that gives them clear, what are the outcomes? Okay, when I design my meat things, I would sit down to project meeting and I'd say, okay, it's got to fit in this parameters on the site. We've got the drawings in. It's got to be within this budget. It's got to work with three people, 250 cattle an hour. You know, I, I, I get to, I don't, I'll do the design work. I don't let the client do that. But I want to know what the outcomes are. When this system is all built, it's a certain price, and it does certain things. And I put them on a list. And I make sure it does those things. You see, it's very concrete. See, one of the things you got to do is you got to get away from being abstract. You know, you see, I, I you know, and, and for a lot of the people that are different to get jobs, they need a portfolio. But in talking to some of the guidance counselors, I talked to a guidance counselor in an engineering program at a university, and they got, you know, guys you know, getting degrees in electrical engineering, really super good, and then they say to the job, I really don't want to design those kind of stupid circuits. Well, you know, sometimes maybe they are stupid, but you design them the best way you can, and as long as they're not going to hurt somebody, that's where I draw a line. I'm not going to design something that's going to kill somebody. If it was electrically dangerous, I would not design that. Now, if it's just stupid, maybe less efficient, I'm trying to explain why I wouldn't design them that way. Now, the thing is, if it's software design, well, the suits aren't going to understand it anyway. You don't have to tell them what you put in that box. I like to put a few Easter eggs in there. There's certain things where you press certain buttons <laughs> on the computer and it gives you a cute picture. Oh, and the other thing that they do on the on circuits is they put their names in. And then when other people counterfeit them, the counterfeit is complete with the with the designer's name in there. Us techies, we don't let the suits know everything that we do. I can really relate to some of that kind of stuff. And I've had to learn over the years better how to explain things to the verbal folks. You know, one thing I've learned is I have to really simplify it down. You know, what is the two-minute presentation? They don't want the half-an-hour presentation. First of all, thank you for your time. If you're going to assist a late teenager who's on the spectrum and they're very nonverbal, any tips or hints for us to help? If he's nonverbal, okay. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, let's look at is this something that he's good at. I mean, there's a lot of people that are nonverbal that could do jobs like in a warehouse, you know, loading boxes on the UPS trucks or something like that. Uh, jobs like putting flyers in envelopes, uh, uh, keeping printing machines full of paper. You know, there's a lot of things that they can do. First of all, start out with what does he like? You know, and then try to maybe you know, work a job around that. See, the problem we got in the autism spectrum is it's all you got a NASA space scientist at one end, and you've got uh, somebody nonverbal at the other end, certainly not going to be a NASA space scientist. You see, it's a, such a big continuum. And the other thing is, 
is that the two ends of the continuum need totally different surfaces. You know, now the people that I talked to last night in the Aspen Club, you know, the 50 to be in that, um, they're the ones that are going to mentor that quirky, nerdy teenager that's on the verge of getting in a pile of trouble and get him going on the right track. And then somebody that's got nonverbal needs a totally different kind of service. And, the, and what I'm seeing happening is the school like, kind of understands how to work maybe with the lower functioning, and they take the quirky, nerdy kid, put him in with a bunch of nonverbal kids. He's not going to go anywhere. So you get the problem you've got with some of these kids is they're gifted in one area and they're very handicapped in another area. And sometimes we bash so much on the handicap, we don't develop the, the area that they're good at. You know, we don't, we're not thinking enough, what is this person going to be when he grows up? What would have happened to me if I got stuck with two semesters of algebra? Maybe I'd be a handyman in a department building. I'm really glad that's not where I ended up. But that's the kind of thing that worries me. You know, I can see happening with a lot of these kids. We have a shortage right now of jobs like diesel mechanics. There's a lot of these different kinds of kids where a job like diesel mechanics, certified welder, we have a shortage there. There's a shortage of nurses. There's a shortage of um, a lot of different types of work. Some of it appropriate for people on the spectrum, some of it is not. Nurse in a regular busy hospital, no. But there's a lady named Anita Lesko, and that's a, she does a brain surgery anesthesia. In fact, I have another book called Different Not Less. And it's about 14 old people on the spectrum like me that were diagnosed later in life because they had relationship problems. They were doing okay on their work. And they all had jobs all their life. And they vary from very high level computer, nurse anesthesiologist, veterinarian, to retail person and tour guide. I deliberately did not fill the book up just with techies. You know, and they vary from an average, average IQ up to genius. And boy, these people had to work hard. It wasn't easy. And they all had paper routes when they were kids. <laughs> See, and I think that we don't have that today, but we got dog walking, like draconian leash laws. They don't walk dogs. You got to do it every day. Don't let them get away. You know, you've um, you got to do it every day, rain or shine. Yes. They go into those categories. So as I'm as I'm processing through this, I'm thinking, so some of what we need to be doing with these kids and in schools is we need to be giving them lots of experiences. Yes. Because if they don't have those experiences, yes. they don't have those experiences. What we gotta do, and I want to repeat this because I don't think a mic picked it up, is is um, I tell parents, get these kids out and doing lots of experiences. His brain comes equipped with a very good Google. But you gotta fill it up with web pages. I gotta, you gotta fill up web pages. Those primal bushes have got stuff to search. Because when I was young, they searched stupid things. You know, now that um, they're filled up, uh, I, then it was really interesting finding them. You know, finding the stuff inside my brain because I'd say, I got a really good Google search engine in my brain. Well, they found the search engine. And they also found the big fibers that go back all the way deep visual cortex. They found my fear center. It's three times larger, and that was on a more conventional, regular type of scanner. They were able to find that, and that's controlled now with antidepressant medication. I know a lot of visual thinkers that if they didn't take a little bit of Prozac or something to, you know, calm the anxiety, they'd be in a lot of trouble. I've been on antidepressants for 32 years, and they got rid of the horrible panic attacks. A lot of us visual thinkers, a lot of problems with panic attacks. A little dab of Prozac. Take too much, you get, an, uh, anxiety, you get insomnia and agitation. Take just the right amount, saves them. And too many of us visual thinkers get messed up on drugs and alcohol because they're trying to do something about the anxiety. You know, a little bit of the right medication can make a difference. But there's too many people just get zombified with too many powerful prescription drugs. Uh, we're not, do we get any questions from the... Uh, uh, Do we have any questions from the uh, webinar viewers? I think we're good. Okay. All right.
Thank you so much, Temple. We appreciate it.